I'd like to recap everyone on, on the history of the Centre for African Spot Public Value Governance. Um, it was founded by three academics with different backgrounds, uh, myself, um, our CM, a senior lecturer in computing with an interest in enabling and emerging technologies for smart governance solutions. And Akila Kodabat, a senior lecturer in international relations who specializes in the studies of world politics and contributes regularly to discussions on African governance. Both of us are from Middlesex University Mauritius, and we are joined by M.M.D. McLuhan, a postdoctoral fellow who focuses his research on examining measures taken by public sector organizations to address their challenges and is based at the KPM Center for Public Management at the University of Bern, Switzerland. So we conceived this concept way back in uh, September 2020, where we looked to develop a center that would investigate governance structures within the, the public sector, but also, also see how we could provide platforms for discussions on how to enhance the quality and governance and establish new ways of developing public management theories, uh, specifically within the African context. So we hope you're going to enjoy this uh, second webinar. At this time, we're focusing uh, now on the African context, whereas previously we launched with a set of discussions uh, in general on public value governance. Uh, and we will have a subsequent webinar uh, where we'll be focusing on the emerging technologies for smart governance solutions uh, in October. So finally, I'd like to give a special thank you to our speakers and their uh, participants for joining us today. Uh, I hope you will gain some useful insights and will join us for some interesting uh, discussions later on. I now hand over to MMD. Yeah, thank you very much, Omar. Um, as already introduced, just some brief um, key information about um, the center that we have uh, launched together. A bit about the background, we, we've realized life um, we are facing increasingly more complexity due to digitalization, climate change, COVID crisis, another example. At the same time, we have new technologies. Um, and when we look at, at Africa, then we need to respect that, that there are diverse social, socio-historical African contexts. So we ask ourselves how, under these circumstances, how public value can be created in the special context by using this opportunity and by challenging and facing all these challenges that we have today. So that's why we've launched this uh, center with mainly two purposes. On the one hand side, a rather practical aim where we want to start a discussion, contribute to the discussion on improving the quality of public governance approaches in Africa, but then also a theoretical approach where we really want to look at um, how theory development in organization studies, as well as in public management, can be improved, can be refined, refined by taking a rather non-Western viewpoint and, and acknowledging that maybe some correlations that we identify in Western countries don't need to be uh, or can automatically be, be adopted. In, in the African context. So we also want to um, find out more and have this broader theoretical contribution. So as I said, we, we, we have these three webinars throughout um, the year. We have started last year on discussing the concept of public value governance. We had three interesting speakers. And today in the second webinar that we've titled with um, unpacking the African context, being aware of course that Africa is a diverse con uh, continent. Um, so there is not one single answer to it and we won't find the final answer um, to this topic, but still making sure, okay, what are the special conditions? Uh, what is different in order to understand how, for example, a concept such as public value governance, other concepts that in theory exist can be adapted or can be approached from a different angle. Um, the three speakers today, um, I want to introduce uh, Joel Botello. Um, he's associate professor um, in, at the Concordia University in Montreal, Canada, at the Chair for Resilience and Institutions. I'm really happy that he's here. Um, just a brief overview about his research. He did a lot of research in the townships of um, South Africa and Cape Town. And I think um, that's how I interpret his work that he realized um, there's a lot of going on, a lot of things that from a traditional Western viewpoint might be ignored and that actually institutional theory, a dominant uh, theory in organization studies 
has also uh, labeled sometimes with institutional void. Although acknowledging that institutional void doesn't mean that there aren't any institution, that there aren't uh, norms, rules, or, um, or, or other rules, um, but um, that, that are kind of ignored. And, um, and he wrote also a critical piece about it, how to use the term, or that we actually have to think differently about this term, that there are actually a lot of things going on that we also can use exactly for theorization, for theory development in organization studies. Um, so that's why um, the title of his presentation today is Far From Void, How Institutions Shape Growth in the Informal Economy. And we will be looking forward to, to understand more um, about his viewpoints. And I think we can definitely gain a lot from his presentation for our discussion in this center. Um, Adila, I'm handing over to you. So thank you, Amandin. And our second speaker is going to be Camila Roca. Uh, so Camila, Camila is the head of research at the Mo Ibrahim Foundation, and she leads on the foundation's research agenda and publications on African governance. Her main research interests are in African political, economic, and social landscape, with a particular focus on uh, the nexus between fragility, development, and state society relations. So uh, the Mo Ibrahim Foundation, um, if you are aware about the work uh, that it does, uh, it produces the Ibrahim Index of African Governance. So Camila is the head of research that produces that now biannual report, if I'm not wrong the index on the IIAG and uh, it's a lot of fascinating data that they offer so the African governance that we hear about and the state of governance in Africa uh, if we want to have a good idea about it the IIAG is one of the indices to, to look at so we have invited Camila because of her extensive research on African uh, governance and data produced on it and to give us an idea about uh, the context of Africa and the data that she can share. So we look forward to her uh, presentation later on. And our third speaker for today is uh, Dr. Folashade Sule Kondu. So uh, Dr. Uh, Sule is uh, um, a senior research associate at the Global Economic Governance Program, um, uh, Bladdaik, sorry, Bladdaik School of Government at the University of Oxford. Her research area focuses on Africa-China relations and on the study of agency in Africa's international relations and the politics of South-South cooperation. So in our center, um, the work that we do and the earlier purpose of our center that Imam Din mentioned to offer a non-Western perspective to the topic of a smart public value led governance. So the idea of how much agency there is in there and the idea of how do we understand uh, agency in the African context and to address a little bit about the misconceptions that we may have. The idea that we are imposed ways of doing things in Africa and so on. So uh, Fula Shade has uh, written much on the topic of African, African agency. And uh, in fact, her presentation title is going to be on unpacking the Africa BRICS relations uh, and focusing on agency. So we look forward to these presentations. And I believe um, I have um, finished presenting the presenters. And uh, we leave the floor to uh, Joel. Hello, everybody. Yeah. You should be okay. able to share now your screen. Yes, yes. Joel, the floor is yours. And after uh, we are giving each speaker 15 minutes to present, and after each speaker's presentation, in case there are any immediate questions, we will welcome them. And then otherwise, we'll leave all the questions until the end of the third speaker's presentation at the end during the Q&A. Um, thank you. The floor is yours, Joel. Great. Well, thank you, everyone. I'm, uh, I'm delighted to present here today. Um, and I'm based on what Emmy has talked about with respect to the goals of the center, I think it's 
an area of, of research and uh, an approach, an epistemological approach that I subscribe to, um, especially in these contexts, which are uh, often pejoratively looked at from a, from a Western perspective. So I, I wanna talk a little bit about a, a project that I've been working on. Um, and this has been a, a project that has been uh, taken in collaboration with our partner organization in South Africa in Cape Town. It's called the Sustainable Livelihoods Foundation. And so um, this is a organization that, um, you know, for many reasons, it's, it's doing really innovative work. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about them as, as we go forward. But one of the major things that they've been doing is to engage in a, um, a micro area census, which is basically to go to the townships in Cape Town. Um, Kimi Meyer, who's, who's in this, uh, who's in this uh, group, he, he knows this uh, organization relatively well and the type of work that they're doing. So they go into the townships and they go street by street, corner by corner, and every time they see someone engaging in uh, entrepreneurial activity, uh, they will survey them and they'll do a short interview with them. They'll geotag the location and also uh, take a picture of their storefront. So you have this you have this data which is extremely rich and which provides a lot of nuance and a lot of uh, you know a lot of correction for what we see in the data, which is derived from macroeconomic surveys, for example. So. Um, a lot of what we've done here is based on this partner organization's work uh, because they've been operating in this context now for about for about 10 years. Um, so our research is situated in the in the informal economy. And um, when we look at it from a theoretical perspective, this is uh, settings which are defined by economic activity that is illegal, but still legitimate to some uh, social group. Okay, so um, unsurprisingly, this uh, constitutes a large uh, variety of, uh, of economic activities. Um, and in low-income countries, uh, 40 to 60% of GDP rising up to 90% in, in the lowest uh, income countries. But even then, we still have pockets of informality in, in high-income countries as well. And so we, in, the, in our arguments, in the projects, in the paper that we're writing, um, uh, we do also want to highlight that you know, there are these pockets of informality in, in high-income countries too. Um, but we were focusing on the entrepreneurs that tend to start their businesses out of survival, and they've been called in the entrepreneurship as being necessity entrepreneurs, um, where they engage in entrepreneurship uh, more so out of a lack of um, paid employment in, in other uh, sectors. And so this constitutes a, a main source of income for uh, working populations rather than a peripheral presence. And importantly for uh, purposes of, of development, um, this does have a role in alleviating inequality and poverty. So um, the city of Cape Town a few years ago uh, 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 did a study and they, dis they discovered that the informal sector income decreases the poverty rate by about 5%. So um, based on what I've talked about here and the, and the work that my uh, partner organization uh, SLF has done, um, there's a rich variety of, of economic uh, activity that goes on in these environments. And so um, SLF has written a book uh, called Unveiling the Informal Economy, and they've, they've looked at all the types of um, you know, industries and the supply chains uh, and the social ties that facilitate economic activities in these contexts. Um, the problem is that when we look at this from a theoretical standpoint, especially coming from a Western uh, management perspective, basically when you look at these contexts, we, we see that they're, um, they're this, right? They're essentially, they're essentially voids. Um, and this is especially true in, in the economic literature where uh, when you do these large scale surveys, um, the informal sector is completely overlooked. Um, and there are numerous reasons for that because uh, you know a lot of this activity is based on census data or tax data, et cetera. So those types of enterprises get completely obscured. And so we have a very biased view of what goes on in those settings. And as a result of that, uh, we have this idea that, as Emmy mentioned, these places are voids. Uh, these are places that lack economic activity. Um, and so, you know, this is a theory which has not been only applied to necessity entrepreneurs and to the informal economy, but also to non-Western contexts more generally. And so, um, as Emmy mentioned, uh, we wrote a critique of this a couple of years ago. Um, my colleagues Rob Nason and, and Gerard Schneider from the UK about the usage of this term institutional voids. Um, and so we look and we criticize this term and we look at how perhaps it's been used uh, inaccurately 
Um, but we didn't want to stop and just write a critique and, and leave it at that, right? We wanted to present perhaps an alternative approach, present a way in which we can move beyond this in a way which is more genuine and which retains some fidelity to the types of economic activity that we see in these varying contexts. So this is kind of where we started. We have this questioning of, of what we see in terms of existing state of, of, of uh, literature and management and how we can kind of build upon that. So. I, I don't want to go too much in the weeds of this article uh, because it does draw quite heavily upon, um, upon the institutional theory literature. But basically, I want to contrast two approaches here. Generally, when we talk about the term institutional voids, the term is based on absence. So um, when we, uh, the way that management, economics, and finance scholars have looked at these uh, non-Western contexts is mainly in comparison to what we have in the West. So what, when they see that there's perhaps a lack of economic activity or a lack of growth in, in non-Western contexts, corruption, et cetera, they view that as being the result of missing legal and market institutions. And so uh, when you do that, and when you do this type of comparison and you view others by what they lack, you necessarily miss what they do have. Okay? So that's kind of what we wanted to focus on in our papers to look at rather the, than these settings being a, a context of institutional absence, where they're missing these market and legal institutions uh, and they're missing firm level growth, um, we wanted to look at it from a situation of presence. Like what are the types of institutions that you have in the informal economy, non-Western context, and how do they enable economic activity in a way that might actually be missed by, uh, by Western scholars? And how does this occur at an individual level? Okay? Because the idea of firm level growth um, in these contexts, especially in the informal economy, is actually kind of bizarre. Individuals They'll grow their business, they'll shut them down, they'll move on to something else very quickly. So we wanted to explore this in a little bit more detail. Um, and I want to touch a little bit upon the types of uh, um, assumptions that we have about growth uh, that come from the, uh, from the West. So what happens is that if you look at the entrepreneurship literature, what we see is that there are certain assumptions about growth, that namely derived from Western economies, that growth happens through the expansion of a vocal firm. And so what we wanted to do in this, in this paper is to think about this idea that what if growth exists just in a way that is not easily identifiable uh, by scholars who are coming from the West? Okay, so, so that was kind of our starting point for, for this paper and this project. And so we, we come up with a couple of uh, novel types of growth modes. Um, and I'll go through a couple of them. And I think we could have gone through more based on the data from SLF, but we picked two because uh, there are, uh, this is in a, a paper which is going through review right now and for space constraints, we focused on two. Um, but we wanted to focus on two that aren't necessarily visible uh, to those that come into these settings with this uh, preset notion that growth happens uh, through the expansion of a focal firm. So the types of growth that we've seen in these contexts um, are the following. So here's the first. The first is called dispersion which is where you have a form of micro diversification where rather than the owner uh, growing their focal firm, what they decide to do is actually spread their investments across diverse micro enterprises that operate across different industries, but also different geographies. So my friend, uh, Tim Weiss at, at Imperial College has, has spent a lot of time in Kenya um, and he's examined um, the emergence of what he calls hustler entrepreneurs. It's not really emergence, they've always been there. Actually, I shouldn't say that word. Um, but these are entrepreneurs who have a proactive and, and outcome focused me mentality. And they try to focus, uh, they don't focus actually, they spread their uh, activities across many different income streams and they find opportunities that emerge and they fill them quickly. So, so the result is that you have an office employee who also has a chicken farm and, and also runs a car wash and a consultancy at the same time. Okay. So this is a form of this um, micro diversification and actually it doesn't make much sense to focus on just one uh, service or one product um, because that's not how these individuals operate in these environments. So I think that provides a very strong contrast with what we see with a single minded fo formal economy entrepreneur. What's interesting is that if you were to go to these contexts and examine these different enterprises, you might get the sense that 
um, you know, these are a bunch of necessity enterprises that are operating independently, but you have to go back and look beyond that and look at the, uh, the individual who runs perhaps multiple uh, operations like this. And so I, I put a picture here of a uh, of uh, something, a, a picture that I took in uh, uh, in South Africa, in, the, in Cape Town, and so uh, you, it's it's an enterprise where the owner um, he runs um, a laundry service, but he also runs uh, soul food and and he runs fish and chips, I think, and some other things. So I saw this and I I thought this was really interesting, and I went to speak with him, and he said, I asked him, why do you do this? You know, like this doesn't make sense. Because from our perspective, it doesn't make sense. You, there's no related diversification going on here. Um, and he says, well, you know, it's very simple. There's very low capital investment uh, in, in these things. So if something fails and doesn't work out, I, it's easy for me to shift to another business rapidly. And I'm, and I'm engaging in laundry because those are the resources that I have. I have a washing machine. So therefore I can run this business quite, quite uh, cost effectively. And so there's no real cost associated with dropping one business that doesn't work and shifting rapidly towards something else. And so I think this questions the idea that we have about what diversification is coming from the West. And we can look at this in terms of a different type of diversification, a different type of growth that is not as visible as what we might see here. So the second type of growth I think is what's, uh, which explains a lot of what we're missing um, in our accounts of growth in these settings. Um, in many of uh, the informal economy settings, there's a stigma around, around growth. Um, and the reason why, is, especially in South Africa, some of, the, uh, some of the entrepreneurs told me about the fact that, um, you know, they have to be very careful about how they grow because they don't want to attract attention. Um, they don't want to attract attention from the police. They don't want to attract attention from, from gangs, from mobsters in the area. They also don't want to attract attention from family members um, because, you know, once you grow, uh, then you have an obligation to, let's say, pay for someone's schooling, or if someone gets injured, you have an obligation to pay for their, uh, for their hospitalization, et cetera. So there's some practical obligations around, uh, practical considerations around attracting attention. And so what we see is that oftentimes in these settings, there's a type of disguised growth. And so the, the picture that I have on the right is of a shabin. Uh, so these are these informal bars that are run in Cape Town. And uh, these are completely clandestine hidden operations. And the only way that you know them, I, this was completely invisible for me, but I think uh, for the members of SLF who are used to operating in, in these townships, they see this. Um, and they, they know that there is a bar I should be operating in the neighborhood because they look for bottle caps on the ground. And so there's no signage, there's, there's nothing out there, but just for looking at these cues that are completely missed by other people, you can tell that there's a business operating here. Um, and, and here's another example of this. Um, in, uh, in the township of Delft in Cape Town, there is a church called the Home of Compassion. It's run by a pastor um, who has decided to diversify into spiritual services, but he also wanted to be very careful about uh, protecting his core business, which is that he's created an IT tech hub on the top floor of his church. And so this is a um, basically where he wants to develop a, a, a digital economy, and he's doing so very discreetly. Um, he showed it to me because you know he thought I could invest in it, uh, but this is something which is completely invisible to the community around him. You know, so you have to be, and I think in these contexts, it's really interesting. There is growth that's happening; it's just completely concealed. These actors have to create this facade of being survivalists. Um, in order to avoid claims of witchcraft, which is something that, uh, you know, a couple of these entrepreneurs told me about. If you're successful, um, then you're seen as, as, as being successful as a result of ill-gotten gains. Um, and so that spurs jealousy, it spurs unwanted attention. So you have to be very careful about how, how you grow. So I think just by looking at these two types of growth, um, we want to make the case that they're is growth that happens in these settings. It's just that it happens in a way which is obscured and which is missing from, um, from our traditional accounts of growth. And so, so in this project, we, we looked at what are the institutional drivers for it, but really the goal of this paper is to recast the informal economy in terms of what they have rather than what they lack in comparison to, the, uh, in comparison to formal economies. And so um, beyond this, we also wanted to look at the types of growth that may exist 
uh, drawing on the experience of our partner organization, uh, Cape Town, because a lot of the entrepreneurship literature um, figures that the best thing to do in these settings is to formalize entrepreneurs and to make them visible to the informal economy so that they can be counted in census data in terms of paying taxes and et cetera. And that's true. And it's good that these organizations should pay taxes, but I think we should also pay attention to what they could potentially be uh, susceptible to, right? By becoming more visible, by becoming formalized, there could be also risks, risks that, that might actually be turn out to be counterproductive. And so I think that's where we also have some policy implications as well too. You know, the push towards formalization I think is, is important, um, but I think we should also consider perhaps how informality and, and visibility, invisibility in this sense is actually a, uh, a useful thing. And it's actually something which has served them quite well. So, so these are sort of the things that we've been, we've been working on recently. And this, this will be more than just one paper. And this is um, more than one project. We really want to expand this and move beyond this conception of, of uh, the informal economy and developing settings as being voids. Um, so I'll, I'll leave it at that. So I look forward to, uh, to additional discussion as we go forward. Thank you. Thank you so much, Joel, uh, for these insightful contributions on that paper and a really fascinating topic on the informal sector and how it's uh, accounted for and uh, your idea of recasting it in terms of what it has rather than uh, what it lacks. So thank you for that. I'm sure there will be more questions later on. Um, uh, we do have one question at the moment from Haberly. Uh, if we can take it, um, a, a quick uh, response perhaps. What about tax legitimate avoidance? Um, I think this is in relation to you, one of your earlier comments. Yeah. Okay, yeah, I think um, if, I, if I understand the question, uh, um, is there legitimacy towards, towards tax avoidance? Is that the, um, is that the question, Christian? Um, I don't know if he's still, if he's back yet from 30 minutes, but I'll, I'll assume that that's what the, the question is. Um, and I think, uh, so we have an ongoing project actually as kind of a, a separate project from this which is where we use the micro area census data and we look at how um, you know, formalizing your business and paying taxes is actually meant to signal yourself to some stakeholders that you are, that you are legitimate or not. Um, and so in that sense, I think, um, you know, I don't wanna give the sense that this is a monolith where all entrepreneurs are kind of the same, but actually what we see is that there are some practices of these entrepreneurs to signal themselves to certain stakeholders and conceal themselves from others. And one of the things that they do is to formalize themselves and to, and to pay taxes in order to signal to police and to, to, to regulatory authorities that they're, that they're legitimate. Um, so others don't do that for, for various reasons, um, but I think there is, there is, there is that happening, you know, that there is uh, some legitimacy for, for paying taxes and some legitimacy for not, um, depending on what the entrepreneur's needs are and what their circumstances are. Thank you, Joel, for this very uh, insightful response. And I think it's re directly related to one of the comments on your slide about activities that is illegal, but still considered legitimate to some social groups. And uh, right. I think uh, that will trigger uh, more discussions later on. Um, but otherwise, um, we shall now- We, we have uh, now... one, one hand yeah. before. Um, I don't yeah, know okay. if it's still- Somebody's virtual hand was up. I. I try to, to just comment, Joel. Thank you for the presentation. It was fantastic. Um, one of my PhD candidates looked at survivalists in Ethiopia. And you know, they they want to be dis they want to disappear because they want to be nimble. Um, so one of the things we have found is that they are not interested in innovation either because innovation costs money. And registering as a business costs money, costs tax. And the moment you, you start considering the cost of tax and the cost of being in the formal sector, they no longer will be able to survive. So that's just another interesting perspective on this. Right, yeah. And I think um, there, are, there are certainly practical considerations as well towards not registering and towards not innovating because of resource constraints. Um, and, and so I think I'd be, I'd be happy to, uh, to learn about the work that your, your PhD student is doing um, in, this, in this area. Um, so, 
and I think that's that's part of it too. And then we also have the entrepreneurs who who grow and who do have resources, but who choose not to do it, right? For um, for in order to just retain the benefits that come from uh, from not being visible. So. Imam, did, did I miss anybody's virtual hand or any questions? No, I, th I think that's, that's the one, yeah. Okay, great, thank you. And then now we will have Camila and she will be offering us an assessment of governance uh, performance in Africa. Camila, the virtual floor is yours. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, First of all, really, I would like to extend my thanks for, for inviting us to, to this very interesting debate. I think the presentation of Joel was extremely, extremely insightful, and I think it would be interesting to continue discussing this later on in the questions. Um, I'm going to put up my presentation, which you should shortly be able to see. Can you please confirm that you can see it? Fantastic. So, uh, this presentation actually touches upon uh, another, I mean, it, it's very much related also to some of the topics that we just discussed about, but the main focus of the presentation is really to um, reflect about uh, assessing governance in Africa. And first of all, I will take you through uh, the methodologies and the tools that the Moy Brain Foundation has created to um, assess governance in Africa. And secondly, I will also provide you with a brief overview of what are the findings of our most recent uh, analysis in terms of what is the, the situation on the continent, what are the challenges, and of course, as well, the best practices and the success stories. So first of all, obviously, a question that I think uh, all of you might have uh, thought of, uh, what is governance? What does, do we mean by governance? I know that this is a very, um, how do you say, overpopulated um, uh, debate in the sense that there is a, a lot of different uh, definitions, a lot of different uh, scholars have come up with uh, completely different overviews and approaches to what governance is. So the foundation has created its own definition. And for us, governance is really the, the, the core relationship that links governments to citizens. And in particular, on the one hand, the provision of key public goods and services that governments have the obligations to deliver to their constituencies. And on the other hand, the uh, sort of um, expectations that uh, citizens have the rights to have towards their government. So this is really about the specific relations between citizens and governments on two sides, basically, of the governance spectrum. Um, the Moi Brain Foundation has dedicated its whole mission to strengthening and reinforcing uh, governance and leadership on the continent. Okay. And one of the key focus uh, and, and the key actions to do that is the establishment of uh, the eBrain Index of African Governance. So once we define governance, once we dedicate to strengthening governance and leadership on the continent, how do we do it? And what, we, what the foundation has come up with is a specific tool, the Ibrahim Index of African Governance, which is a framework that helps any audience interested in assessing governance with uh, the, the, the tools to, to, to measure governance. And in practice is a data set. It's a data set that allows us to analyze results and governance performance across First of all, a number of dimensions. You can see here, I'm pretty sure that, I'm, I'm not sure whether you can see it to the clearest point, but I'm happy to share the presentation later. So we can see here, for instance, the uh, framework of the index. We have the overall governance score, obviously, and then uh, grounded on four uh, pillars, which are our thematic categories that go from security and rule of law, participation, rights, and inclusion, economic yes. opportunity, and uh, human development. Wow. And these are basically, I think someone, okay. And then um, these are obviously built on underlying subcategories and indicators. So it's really like a very complex structure and based on 
sort of conceptual framework. And then we also have a section dedicated to citizen voices because the index is all about not only measuring um, the outcomes of policies, but it's also putting quite a strong focus on the role of citizens in the governance relationship that we were discussing before. And we thought that including perspectives of citizens, it's fundamental to really complete and provide a comprehensive assessment of governance on the continent. Um, the index was created in 2007. The governance landscape is changing constantly. Demands and expectations from citizens are evolving. So the index, as it is now in 2020, includes, for instance, new topics that were not there at the very beginning. We now included, for instance, environmental sustainability. We included, for instance, uh, equality and non-discrimination indicators. We also have a stronger focus on uh, social safety nets, for instance, so a whole new set of topics that now are part of the governance discussion. We also have created, as we discussed just now, a section that really completes the official and expert assessment data with citizens' perspectives, really to underline the core role of citizens in governance. And also we have um, expanded uh, considerably the number of sources that we use and the number of variables from source in a way that allows us that uh, 90 percent of our indicators which is basically the the, the sort of smallest level uh, that we uh, of, of data and assessment that we can provide within the framework are clustered meaning that they are based on more than a source or a variable which statistically makes them stronger indicators of, 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 of governance and basically uh, gives us a, a likely closer um, overview of the reality on the ground, on the topics and uh, countries measured. As we said, the index, it's really like a compilation of all um, existing uh, data sources related to um, the governance dimensions that we have identified. This is a sort of visual representation of the journey of a data point. So how do we collect the data and how do they feature into the index? Obviously we do have specific selection criteria. We go through consultations to verify the data. We collect and calculate the data so that we basically departing from various scales because obviously each of our 40 plus data sources have their own criteria, their own uh, numerical standards, we put them on the same scale. And then there is an element of aggregation of the data to build all those levels of the index that we discussed before, from the indicator level to the subcategory, the category, and finally all this adds up to forming what we call our overall governance score in Africa. This said, we also created um, a system to analyze the data because Basically, when we arrive at this point of having the data set ready, this is an Excel file uh, full of scores that sort of check, um, assess the performance uh, at a specific point in time. But the governance landscape is also um, uh, a very slow changing one. The outcomes of policies take years to sort of get implemented. And there is also like, statistically um, uh, very little um, uh, little change in the scores and in the numbers. So we have set up um, what we call a trend classification approach to our analysis. So on the one hand, as I said, we can check for each of the composing years of the decade under review, the scores and trends, but we can also look at the decade as a whole and um, sort of run uh, a trend analysis that compares the 10 years and the performance of a country or a, a specific governance uh, a specific governance I mentioned over the decade compared to the mid period. So not only this will give us an overview of like where the con how the context has been evolving, but it's also giving us an overview of how the mid period is setting the direction of a country, of a region, or of the continent. And for instance, here 
we have created also a series of classifications that are the possible um, sort of interplay of results that we can get from the analysis. You could have a country that is showing improvement over the 10 years and within the mid period of the last latest five years, this improvement is sort of even stronger. You could have a country that is showing warning signs in the sense that it's showcasing basically a decline in the most recent period. You could also have the, the, the mid period showcasing even worse decline than the one in the decade. So we thought that this proposes an analysis of the data that is also quite pragmatic and is also quite telling about um, early signs of best practices, but also uh, possible challenges in certain governance dimensions. So this was it for uh, the, the sort of behind the scene work that goes into the index. And now we are going to look into how do these results uh, are showcased in our publications and what are the key findings of uh, the 2020 Brain Index of African Governance. So first of all, we look at the overall governance that, as we said before, is the highest level of aggregation of all the results. And we can see here that the main story is that in 2019, for the first time over the whole decade under analysis, there is a decline in the overall governance score. And this decline is happening in a context of improvement over the last decade but an improvement that has significantly slowed down in the last five years of the decade, as we said before. So it's showcasing basically that in the last five years, the continent has not sustained the same rate of improvement that was there over the decade. Still, uh, in 2019, more than 60% of African population is living in a country where governance is better than it was in 2010. And this is a major positive results that we need to take stock of. However, if we want to understand what drives change over the decade under analysis, we have to look at the subcategory results. And here you can have uh, an example of one of the infographics that then we elaborate with our team uh, that really shows you that uh, of the four pillars, the categories building the index, there are two which are driving progress. And there are two that are driving decline. So on the one hand, the continent has, has made incredible progress in Foundation for Economic Opportunity and Human Development. And we see, for instance, that uh, improvement in infrastructure, health, or sustainable environment has been the drivers of this positive change. However, on the other hand, this progress is sort of threatened by alarming deteriorations in other two categories of the index, participation rights and inclusion, security and rule of law. And this is due to a precarious situation in terms of security combined with erosion of rights, civic and democratic spaces. What is interesting uh, in terms of this sort of two paths that the African government, is, the African uh, continent is taking in terms of governance progress is that for 20 countries over the continent, which are almost 42% of the African population, there was a simultaneous improvement in human development and economic opportunity. But this was happening at the same time as a decline in security and rule of law and participation rights and inclusion. And this is visually represented in this infographic in which you can really see on the one hand, the sort of red, which is our increasing deterioration categories, driving the change in these two and the positive progress in human development and foundation for economic opportunity. We also run a very sort of quick analysis of how do these results sort of uh, interplay with COVID-19. The data set stops at 2019, so it doesn't really assess the impact of COVID yet, because as we said, we do look back a decade. But we can already see, for instance, that when COVID-19 hit Africa, um, there was already an ongoing de de deterioration and erosion of participation rights and inclusions and security and rule of law. 
So COVID-19 obviously is likely to have worsened or to have impacted some elements, for instance, election interference, civil society shrinking states and all that. But COVID-19 is not responsible because there was already a sort of existing deterioration ongoing. Uh, whereas if we pick the example of Foundation for Economic Opportunity, this is quite interesting because this is one of the best trending categories of the index. The one that is driving progress, as we saw before, driven by infrastructure, for instance, that is one of the best trending um, sort of dimension of the index. However, COVID-19 has really abruptly impacted the government, the, the, the continent, when it was on a path of improvement. And this is likely also to reverse this progress or at least put it on hold um, as, as things develop as we speak, basically. Um, now, very quickly, an analysis of uh, governance cannot be based only on official and expert assessment data, as we said before. So we included this section looking at basically what do African citizens think or what are their perceptions about governance delivery in their countries. Most of these results are uh, sourced by existing Afrobarometer rounds, and we are also working in partnership with Afrobarometer to continue developing the research so that one day we will be able to have possibly a sort of Afrobarometer surveys covering and mirroring all the dimensions covered in the index. As you can see here, the data speaks by itself. Um, the African average score for public perceptions of overall governance, which is the macro level, is the lowest uh, registered over the 2010-2019 period. So it really mirrors also what has happened with the overall governance score in the index. And there is a path of deterioration in the last five years, which is um, double than the deterioration over the 10 years. So it's really like a concerning story. And we see here uh, outlined in different colors the trends for each of the um, subsections of citizens' voices. And I mean, um, really, citizens are uh, not happy with the delivery of governance on the continent. And if you want, we can go into the details of this uh, later on in the questions. And then two couple of final remarks. What is important and the message that we really want to pass to all of you when you approach uh, using the data sets, which is very, very important. Um, obviously, you need to be, for instance, Mauritius. We are speaking with some of our <laughs> fellow Mauritians here. Mauritius is topping the index. Mauritius has been one of the best performing countries of the index for, for a while already. Doesn't mean that you don't need to be happy. You, need, you, you can celebrate yourselves or the, these positive results. But on the other hand, do not only look at the absolute numbers of the scores. We know that Mauritius has the highest score and this is celebrated by being uh, topping the index. But on the other hand, if we apply the analysis of the trend classification that we did before, the 10 years compared to the last five years, we can see that Mauritius is not sustaining the progress. Mauritius is on a path of increasing deterioration, meaning that the score in 2019 has been deteriorated compared to 2010. And the difference in score in the mid period from 2015 to 2019 has been even deteriorating faster. So this is a sign of alert in the sense that a country like Mauritius should think, OK, if you want to continue remaining number one, you need to sustain progress. Otherwise, you see already what is happening at number two. There is a path of increasing improvement. So these sort of trends that we analyze through the trend classification showcase the, the sort of change, the likely change that other countries are going through that could potentially also reverse the chart. And another example, Somalia is ranking 54th, so it's at the bottom of the index. But what is interesting in, is that contrary to Mauritius, is on a path of increasing improvement. Uh, to close the presentation, uh, uh, ju just a reflection about um, governance progress. 
and what is important when considering and analyzing governance progress. As we saw before, the continent in the last decade has taken two totally different directions, and we have human development and economic opportunity driving positive change at the expense of declines in participation rights and inclusion and security and rule of law. Analyzing the countries that are best performers, we however see that if countries are following an harmonious improvement in all the dimensions of the index, these are likely to perform better. And these are only eight in Africa. You can see the list here. Only eight countries manage to undergo this harmonious approach to all governance dimensions and to improve steadily in all of these. And this is statistically and supported by the data, the uh, best practice to uh, achieve a better overall governance score and a better overall governance performance. So the message here should be, how could the continent redress this diverging path and set itself on an harmonious progress towards all governance dimensions without forgetting or without putting on the side important governance dimensions. Because for us, all of the governance dimensions are at the same level and the index is not weighted, which means each of the elements counts as all the others. So this is basically it for the presentation. Any questions, I'm here. Thank you so much, Camilla, for this overview of the work of the Mo Ibrahim Foundation, uh, especially on the Ibrahim uh, Index of African Governance. I think for me, it's the third time that I'm listening to a presentation from uh, about the Ibrahim Index. And every time there is a new perspective that I'm uh, willing to explore further. So um, the data may be fixed, but then the, the way that we explore it and we analyze it, there's always um, questions to be asked there. So uh, thank you so much. Any questions we have at the moment uh, about Camila's presentation? Thank you, Alfred. Um, Camila, if you wish to address this question now, up to you. I'm reading it now. Uh, yeah, it's, it's quite an interesting question, actually. If you want, we can discuss also later. Um, we saw exactly that the index scores in um, Foundation for Economic Opportunity are the ones driving the positive change, okay? However, when we look at the citizen perceptions, it's quite interesting that the, the, the subsection that is scoring the lowest is the one for Foundation for Economic Opportunity. We did, I mean, besides the index, we did quite a lot of extensive research about the whole idea of, um, the Afri Africa's growth of the last decade being jobless and not having sort of um, resulted in opportunities for African citizens and all that. So we think that this could hint to a sort of gap in that, in that sense. Um, on the other hand, as I said before, the limitation of comparing the index results with the citizens' voices result lies in the fact that for the time being, we still don't have 100% overlap between the variables that we measure in the index and the variables that we measure through the Afrobarometer survey. So I would be cautious about, you know, like taking conclusions based on this. But indeed, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's good to ask these questions. And I think also additional research besides the index can also help sort of complementing this kind of picture as well. Thank you, Camilla. I think we can discuss that uh, in depth later on. Um, unless I have missed anyone's virtual hand up, um, we will move to our third speaker of the day, uh, which is who is going to be uh, Fola Shadi. So um, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let me share my screen. 
Yes, can you see it all? Yeah, okay. So my presentation will focus on um, the role of agency in uh, the relationship between Africa and uh, BRICS countries or more largely emerging powers. I'm thinking of Russia, India, China, Turkey, uh, and so on. So um, for the past uh, decade, I would say now, there's been a rising interest, uh, a rising global interest uh, in Africa, uh, and this has been manifested by uh, a rising number of what I call Africa plus one summits. So Africa, China, Africa, Russia, uh, also Africa, UK, Africa, US. There are lots of fora, uh, but there's also a growing number of countries, uh, non-traditional countries, even like Finland or Estonia, who are establishing an Africa strategy. Um, and so what we can see here is that beyond the traditional partners uh, that the continent has, I'm thinking of, you know, the, the UK, uh, the US, France, the European countries more largely, uh, there's a growing involvement of new partners uh, or, that come with a renewed interest in the continent. And by renewed, I mean, uh, it's not new in the sense that China and Africa, for instance, already had several partnerships but during the Cold War period, they were more based on ideology and a bit of economy, whereas now uh, everything that's economic and market focused and investment, it has more um, of the priority. Um, and so in this sense, these countries engage in uh, a reciprocity in terms of both economic and political interest. And so the literature so far has largely focused on what these uh, so-called new partners, the BRICS and all, are uh, doing in Africa in terms of their investment, in terms of their interests. Uh, what is it that um, they uh, seek? Uh, what is it uh, that you know they get from this relationship? How are they, and also how they are competing, especially traditional and uh, non-traditional partners. I'm thinking, namely, of the U.S.-China uh, relationship. Um, and so this has been largely covered by the literature, but what has been less covered by the literature is you know, just to, to switch or flip the question around and ask what is it that African uh, governments get from these uh, engagements, from these summits? Why are they motivated in, getting in, in um, attending these summits? Uh, and also why is it that they attend some summits uh, and less uh, others, uh, and and this has been, this is has has been the topic of an article that I published um, last year in uh, African Affairs, and that investigated you know the summit diplomacy uh, and also the need to recenter African agency in this narrative and to go beyond what has been labeled as the new scramble narrative. Uh, and so this presentation will look a bit at uh, these aspects, but I'd be happy to uh, discuss it more during the Q&A session. So very briefly, as um, well, many of you already know, China and Africa has been largely discussed, largely covered. Um, it's interesting when I discuss with senior policymakers uh, for my research on how they consider China and Africa, many, uh, one, um, characteristic comes up very often, and that is that China is a hyperactive partner, meaning that beyond uh, what we already know, meaning uh, you know, natural resources, extraction, uh, infrastructure, investment, they are all involved in so many other sectors that go from technology to agriculture to culture. Uh, to sports and so on. And on this graph, you can see also how this has been manifested by the growing links of diplomatic ties that have been established with African countries uh, across the years, and also some Confucius Institutes uh, and, and so on. Uh, but also what has been lately on the news are you know, the various Chinese loans in Africa um, that are for some countries that are more indebted than others and, and also risking you know, 
about this debt distress, I'm thinking namely of countries like Zambia, Angola, uh, and lately you now discussions, yes, since a few days also on how Ethiopia will deal with uh, all, all these loans. Um, but that is to say that China is the largest bilateral creditor uh, in Africa, uh, whereas the World Bank is still the largest multilateral one. Um, the digital Silk Road, there's also been much discussions about that, all the different smart city initiatives. Um, so let's say that, you know, it's it's very multidimensional in terms of uh, what China is doing uh, in Africa. However, there's a trade imbalance, a trade imbalance with China um, exporting more to the continent uh, then, you know, importing from the continent, and that is something these asymmetries have been also discussed in terms of the benefits that the continent could get from it in terms of access to the Chinese market, which is not always easy. Um, and, and also, politically speaking, there's also been a, a change in terms of how, um, and that is also one of the results of this engagement for China, it's that they uh, they also um, get more support for their multilateral and also controversial initiatives in uh, multilateral institutions. So looking here at how um, the correlation of you know, United Nations General Assembly resolutions, the voting patterns, Africa is more, African countries are more and more closer, you know, aligning on China uh, in, in these institutions. Um, peacekeeping now China is the first is the second uh, peace, uh, contributor to peacekeep the UN peacekeeping budget and the much implications in uh, in the Sahel uh, for instance and uh, we can also discuss this more later but um, it's it's also very diverse in terms of uh, not only you know providing peacekeeping operations but you know, establishing bilateral strategic ties with these uh, countries and um, and also using these as uh, you know a platform and uh, opportunities for selling um, for selling surveillance uh, materials to these uh, to African countries. Um, very briefly, also, India is also one of the countries involved, uh, increasingly getting involved in Africa, uh, although, you know, it's not on the same pace as China, but still there are increasing links, not only in trade, but also in health cooperation, agriculture, um, and um, also in terms of expanding diplomatic and military presence, what you can see here is that there are also an increasing number of Indian embassies on the continent. Um, and so the, the, I'm, I'm making this large, uh, you know, a, a introduction, I would say, to show that the, there's a rising interest uh, on the continent. And later on, I'll, I'll, we will get into more details on what uh, and why the con con African nations are getting involved uh, in this. Uh, Turkey-Africa uh, summit is also, what you can see here is that it, mostly these summits are uh, biennial or, you know, every three years, uh, there's one currently also being um, being prepared uh, between Turkey and Africa. But here again, there's also a stronger co uh, cooperation with Africa, both in terms of bilateral trade volume um, that has reached 18 billion in 2017. There are now more than 8,000 African st uh, students, you know, that are getting scholarships. Uh, Turkey also provides an annual support of 1 million to the African Union. And, uh, you know, the in increasing connections, uh, you know, airlines connections uh, between the continent's uh, capitals and, uh, and Turkey. Uh, and so let's say that Turkey also has reorganized its aid and development cooperation via the Turkish Cooperation and Coordination Agency that has now 21 program uh, coordination offices uh, in uh, across Africa. Of course, there are some countries that are more of interest, you know, uh, where Turkey is more involved. I'm thinking of you know, countries like Sudan, uh, Somalia, uh, also Libya, you know, with, and that can, although that can be discussed later on, on you know, the uh, more or less good or less uh, good impact uh, of Turkey uh, in the Libyan crisis. Uh, Russia, very briefly, also the latest summit was in Sochi 2019. There's one that is being currently um, prepared also for 2021. 
uh, trade and economic relations have also increased and especially major Russian companies in Africa and some very strategic you know, sectors like gas and oil and um, mines. Uh, but Russian military presence is also, you know, controversially also uh, present. Uh, in various countries through uh, both military cooperation, but also uh, mercenaries and private security companies uh, that are being, and, and these are often asked, uh, it's not, Russia is not the one offering that necessarily in terms of cooperation, but it's some, very often some of the governments in place that ask for these uh, mercenaries to come in. And one of what well, there are talks now of, Mali also asking for more um, private security companies and mercenaries, uh, given the, the, the context, the security context on the continent. So the question is uh, beyond all, you know, this large implication, this multidimensional implication, what is it that African leaders are getting from these partnerships? And why are they um, getting engaged in these partnerships in the first place? What I showed in my article in African Affairs is that uh, the attendance of African, um, by African heads of states or heads of government uh, and uh, presidents and uh, is very different from one uh, one summit to another, for instance, it is you, it is uh, you can see that over the past five to ten years, there's a growing engagement uh, and a grow, uh, let's say, a higher level of seniority um, and a growing a larger number of attendance by African nations um, in in summits organized by China. Uh, by Russia, by Turkey, uh, more than uh, the UK, or even more, they are more present in these, um, they attend more of these summits than they do attend, for instance, the UN General Assembly uh, summits. And I make this comparison in, in the article. And it's um, also, you know, it's when you look, for instance, at the latest UK uh, Africa summit, that was, I guess, about two years ago, there were just, 14 heads of state uh, and, and governments, whereas the one in in China before in Russia, there were over 20 to 25 and over more than 30 even in um, in the China Africa uh, summit. So um, looking at this, it's it's a way of putting back agency and asking ourselves, uh, how do they exercise agency in this relationship? Uh, where um, it's important to recenter African agency, otherwise it, the narrative will always be one of uh, the gov one of African governments just being passive in these summits, whereas just from the start they choose to be there. They choose whether they are there or not. And one problem with the new scramble narrative also is that when you look at the initial scramble from the Berlin conference, um, it's uh, African nations were not independent. You know, they, so they were not sitting at the table here. They have more choice. They decide uh, when and, and why they will attend these summits. Uh, and it's important already to keep that in mind uh, when another analyzing their, their international relations. So this graph shows that it's important to, beyond just saying that, you know, there's, these countries have agency, uh, you know, the agency has been now used, it has become kind of a buzzword and uh, in international relations, there's this, uh, what we call the agency turn. Uh, so it's important to, you know, unpack what it is and why it's important when, well, um, when analyzing where agency uh, is and lies, it's important to locate it and uh, you know unpack it and look first at the actors who are the ones exercising agency. So it's important to identify you know the very specific sets of states officials uh, that are located in the specific parts of the state system, um, and also look at you know which where is it which ministries, for instance. In my work on Africa-China negotiations, I. You know, investigate very uh, specifically which type of civil servants are exercising agency when they negotiate with China, because they, uh, depending on where they are located, they exercise it differently. And also what are their resources, their um, 
the uh, you know the, the tools uh, since they are differently negotiated uh, ne sorry located in the system uh, they don't have necessarily the same uh, resources like a, a civil servant uh, does not necessarily exercise um, agency at the same way the president does for instance um, and so also the context depending on the context uh, ex agencies also exercised uh, more or less with impact or not and so it, it's important to analyze it you know in its full complexity uh, and include this um, time uh, variable whether it's you know other and you know, whether it's currently whether it's uh, you know in the past how is it that the exercise of agency has evolved over time um, and so when I uh, coming back to Africa and BRICS uh, relations I have identified four strategies uh, and for I mean, the reason for which they uh, get involved in all these summits with uh, the BRICS nations and, and relations more generally. The first one is uh, to attract investments, FDI in a competitive environment. Um, and I'll get back to that one a bit later on. And the second one is to diversify economic partners to reduce dependency and not only dependency on on traditional partners, you know, like on, on the US or France for Francophone Africa or the UK, but just to, that, to reduce sometimes dependency on a new partner like China uh, for, for some. The third uh, strategy is to tactically uh, claim back uh, their economic policy space through some initiatives like the Dakar Declaration on Debt and the, there was, I think, about two days ago, the Abidjan Declaration, you know, also on on questions related to fiscal space, where the, the president of uh, Cote d'Ivoire called, you know, for the IMF to review some of its policies, and uh, the fourth one is one that is more symbolic, and that is for some, you know, by getting involved with these countries, it's a way to at least, you know, symbolically and temporarily escape from political isolation by getting a bit more visibility and expanding networks. So. Uh, very briefly, if you look at this, attracting investment is something that uh, many African co uh, countries compete for. Um, although there are, there's an increasing number of FDI flows on the continent, it's still very much located in five uh, big countries. Um, I'm thinking of, you know, Egypt, uh, South Africa, uh, GRC, the latest according to UNCTAD. But, um, there are many of these countries try to attract investments uh, from new partners and uh, you, ha you have countries like Senegal who do that according to their uh, Plan Senegal uh, Emergent, um, you know, their, their national development plan while and trying to diversify partners by you know, making Turkey fund specific, you know, projects like airports or, or stadiums, you know, and, and bringing uh, Russia to, um, you know, fund uh, other sectors of these, uh, of the, of the, of these uh, plants uh, and of their priorities. It's same for Kenya through the, uh, there's a, a strategic uh, Kenyan investment, I think it's called KIP, Kenyan investment program. Um, and so attending these summits is a way for them also to, um, to, well, to not, well, to attract more investors uh, to, uh, to their uh, home country. And there's a general sense that with new partners, you know, there are more opportunities, you know, to have some concrete uh, investment, some concrete uh, infrastructure projects being built, whilst with the traditional partners, uh, it, it just takes more time. And, you know, there are, there's more also, well, they, it's a bit caricatural, but it's, some would tell me that, you know, they, they are more, there's more talk uh, with uh, traditional partners, whereas with the new partners, it gets into the concrete dimension, at least a bit more quickly. Um, you know, also partner diversification, 
as I mentioned, is something uh, very uh, important. Uh, as you can see on this graph, some countries uh, succeed in doing it uh, more than others. And, and I'll get back to that uh, later because I see that time flies a bit. Uh, but very also to talk about, you know, claiming back economic policy space, especially for these countries who are now uh, struggling uh, with economic recovery following the COVID crisis. Uh, and even before, you know, there was this discussion on sustainable development and debt where African, uh, during the Dakar declaration in December 2019, there was this coordinated move to ask uh, for a review of you know, the, the notion of risk uh, in Africa and, the, and how um, African uh, economies are rated uh, by not only the IMF, but also for instance, by, um, by the, uh, all these uh, rating agencies. And that's something that these governments consider that you know, is not in favor or at least it isn't um, attracting uh, or jeopardizes you know, attracting investments uh, on the continent. One aspect also is, as I mentioned earlier, is you know, to escape temporarily from political isolation. Very, uh, in cases like in the CAR, in the Central African Republic, but also in, um, um, in, 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 in cent yeah, sorry, I said in CAR and in Guinea, uh, these countries, at least the political leaders were uh, isolated following um, uh, the following elections that were not democratically organized and also the fact that they changed constitutions to uh, seek for a third term in, in the case of uh, Guinea, for instance. And so very often they were not invited to uh, the, but to um, summits organized by traditional partners, whereas you know, in the case of Russia, for instance, it's more about doing business first. And so attending these summits um, is a, a way also to escape at least temporarily from political isolation to be seen worldwide. And so there's this symbolic dimension that allows these uh, leaders at least to be still um, internationally active. Uh, to some extent. And so that's also, this symbolism is also important in how uh, they, um, you know, they, they exercise uh, uh, agency. And maybe just to conclude here, I would like to use this quote by Maki Sall, who said that uh, in October, who mentioned that Africans uh, today know exactly what, what their priorities are and that partners will gain a lot in listening deeply to Africa and Africans. And what I, cons uh, what I, um, analyzed via this quote is that uh, we are now in this context where um, many of these African leaders are moving from this role of rule takers also to, uh, you know, rule makers, at least in terms of how priorities are set on the continent. And I can see that very concretely in the Africa-EU partnership where at least we're doing all the preparatory discussions of the new uh, EU Africa-EU strategy. Um, about 10 to 20 years ago, it looked more like a strategy, uh, let's say uh, an EU strategy uh, for Africa uh, and how the, the way African interests were integrated in this agenda is very different from now, where they ca they are more um, sitting and at the table asserting themselves. And the fact that we are also in a new uh, and new, I would say, geopolitical uh, situation, and where the continent has many more partners than it used to, uh, they. Uh, not all of them at the same time, but some of these countries tend to use this in a very much strategic way to assert themselves and also to gain more from this relationship uh, than uh, they used to in, uh, they used to, let's say about 10 to 20 years ago. So uh, let me uh, finish here and I'll be happy to answer any questions uh, or comments you may have. Thanks. Thank you so much for a uh, fascinating presentation with a lot of insights. And um, as you can see, um, um, all of our three speakers have different uh, topic presentations and they have offered different perspectives and uh, it's very broad. We, the very title of our webinar, Unpacking the African Context is, is deliberately left broad which is why we are very uh, grateful. We thank each one of our speaker, uh, speakers for their insights and their contributions from 
distinct um, uh, areas. And I wish to open the floor to questions now uh, um, to Iva Fulashade in regards to her presentation or any other questions uh, to each of our speakers. Adila, hi, I just had a Kai, a kind of question comment. Sorry, I joined late. Um, but um, you know, one thing that comes to mind is that perhaps this is kind of um, a Western-centric perspective that I still need to um, rid myself of. But it seems like the West is really kind of losing traction in Africa, particularly from a business point of view. Now, of course, we've got the legacy of colonialism, which is a double-edged sword, leaving languages, legal systems. However, in last week's Economist, I was really struck by the decline in the proportion of US-based um, investment overseas. And you can, it's, it's a, a steep decline over the last 20 years, over which time the investment of China has also increased. So anyway, I just thought I'd, I'd just share that probably trite observation. I mean, you know, because Africa needs many things. Africa, of course, you know, even the term Africa is kind of a, a term that is, I understand originated from Europe. It's not even a term that Africans traditionally themselves use. But is there anything that, we, that can be done to those of us who still, I suppose, you know, to those of us at Middlesex, as I am, we, you know, we're kind of perhaps more from the tradition of looking at the positive aspects of Western culture, such as, you know, liberal democracy, um, you know, free trade and, and otherwise. Is there anything that we can do to kind of, um, ensure that there's more of a balanced trade and that we can put behind us kind of the, the toxic legacy of colonialism while acknowledging that, you know, we're moving into a multipolar world. So it's kind of a combination, comment, question. And like I said, I'm sorry I couldn't make the rest of it, um, but uh, be happy for any insights. Can I say something about yes. this? Well, thank you for your comment. I think that um, I read also the, the piece in The Economist, so I, I, I specifically see what you're referring to. I think it's important to note first that the, the, the graphs they were using were mostly trade uh, flows in merchandise. Uh, so it's, uh, it's important to make this distinction because, because you know, they didn't use, for instance, services. And when you uh, look, and it's important, and you did that to make this distinction between trade and FDI, because when you look at the flows and also the stocks, I would say, of FDI in, in Africa, it's still um, mostly Western nations, something like US, Netherlands, France. They are, uh, they are the, in the UK, uh, and China is fifth. And, and this is the, the highest rank China has got so far, because it used to be, you know, it's not really an investor. They are more of a, you know, of course, Africa's first trade partner now in, in merchandise, uh, uh, a bit less in services. But what we are seeing is just, a, I would say, so, sort of a, a reorganization, you know, and, and a more of a, uh, a, va a diversification of partners, as I mentioned in my presentation, that is something that the continent is witnessing. And I, in my opinion, that is something uh, positive. But uh, in terms of um, values, uh, it's, uh, you know, there's this, um, people are sometimes uh, scared that uh, the, the rise of China will lead to uh, a decrease in democratic values on the continent. When you look at um, you know, some of the results of the latest Afrobarometer surveys, you will see that there's still a strong demand for you know, democracy on the continent. And by democracy, I mean you know, uh, you know, fair elections, uh, transparency. Uh, and, and so there's still a demand for that. So I'm, personally, I would not be uh, afraid of, of this. In terms of what, also your question about what the West of what Western countries could do, I think that there's now more of a, uh, you know, uh, they, they are increasingly becoming uh, aware of uh, some of the shortcomings of the ways of doing, you know, development cooperation uh, uh, on the continent. And what we've seen with China is what I call some kind of a reverse socialization, meaning that they also learn from what China does. The fact that infrastructure is now becoming quite you know, important and central in many of these countries' uh, you know, engagement with the continent is a way also of 
taking more into account what African countries and governments want. Uh, there's, in the case of the US, you know, Africa was very much seen quite you know, exclusively, I would say, as you know, in terms of security issue. Now, uh, problems, security risk, uh, military interventions, that, that was very strong in the way um, the US organized its Africa policy. There's also a shift now. You know, with, uh, they are talking about the B3W, but even before that with Prosper Africa. So let, what I want to say you know, in, a, in a nutshell is that there's a change and it would be interesting to see how this evolves. And in my opinion, what is even more important is just how African uh, governments will manage all these rivalries and all these interests because they can gain from it if they manage it uh, successfully. Thank you so much, Fulashade. I think you've addressed all of the questions by Stephen. Uh, thank you so much to that. And um, any other questions from our participants? I have one, um, if I may, Imam Din <laughs> and uh, Amar. So uh, for our speakers, um, Joel, um, earlier you mentioned that the informal sector tends to be completely overlooked and uh, in terms of uh, uh, normally we'll be looking at census data and tax data. That's where we will have a sense about um, formal sectors and uh, informal sectors and how we account for them, uh, giving some vis visibility to each one of these sectors. M my question actually is um actually uh, to camilla how would the the ibrahim index actually capture informality in the data in the range of data that uh, indicators that you have sorry joel i think my question is for camilla <laughs> okay that's uh that's an interesting question that we get asked also quite often. So we need to um, clarify that the index includes uh, variables that range from um, outcomes of policies, okay, a little bit about input of policies, for instance, in the case of environmental sustainability or area where we need to, um, we don't have enough policy outcomes to, to, to sort of create a, a full overview, uh, or in areas, for instance, like environmental sustainability that are rather recent, so we don't have enough data sources that can give us um, uh, just policy outcomes. And then we look at the perceptions, but we deliberately do not include, um, for instance, uh, macroeconomic variables, we do not have data about GDP, we do not have, do not have data about employment, and we do not have data about uh, about informality as well, because I mean, th there is quite a lot of, of reasons behind it. But also, I mean, we thought that um, otherwise this would, um, you know, like we need to uh, select only sources that do tell us something about governance. And there is no direct link sometimes between the number of unemployment or unemployed people and governance um, sort of inputs and there is no direct link with GDP. I mean there is we see governance as a conducive environment for some of these indicators but not these are not just governance measures. I don't know if I make it very clear. Obviously then if you look at the overall index, there are some elements that can help you trace back what is the situation, not only in terms uh, of economic opportunity, where you can see uh, sort of outcomes related to what extent, uh, for instance, the, 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 the elements related like GDP growth and all that that are outside the index are reflected in index scores. Uh, and you can run that with informality as well. And then we have quite a lot of other variables, for instance, in human development that can tell you quite a lot about that in the sense that we have variables about social safety nets, which are fundamental in this, in this sort of discussion about informality. And so I think you can trace back and you can use the index as um, a sort of complementary to, to those discussion, but you will not find the specific data there. Um, and I think, I mean, that, that's, you know, like, that's how the index is supposed to be, because we want to position really this index as providing the governance landscape rather than responding to 
specific detailed re research questions that can be uh, sort of responded to using the raw data sources that we use in the index, okay? We want to position this index as providing the governance landscape for, you know, like understanding better other variables that are outside of the index. The index cannot measure everything, but it, for instance, in a discussion about informality, you can pick and choose some variables in the index that can help you better understand what is the so, for instance, economic opportunity in certain countries, what is the level of um, uh, support that is given in terms of health access, education access, or uh, social safety. So it, it really provides a complementary overview that is relevant to those discussions. Thanks, Camilla. Um, Joel, did you want to share? Um, yes, something here. Right. Um, so one of the ways I think in which we've been able to uh, I, I think there's some novel studies coming out for detecting uh, the level of informal ac uh, economic activity. And so I, I put, I'll put two in the, um, in the chat box where um, it's the usage of satellite data, uh, where you can look at, uh, it, it's very interesting because you can look at uh, the level of light intensity at night, and you can use that as a proxy for, for economic growth. So what you do is you compare that to the actual economic growth numbers, which are reported by the countries. Um, and then you compare that to the intensity of light. So, and that is actually a, a relatively good proxy for determining the level of economic, uh, informal economic activity versus uh, formal activity. So, um, so I think it's, it's, I mean, detecting informal economic activity has been exceptionally difficult for, for obvious reasons because it's hidden. Um, but I think there are some novel ways of, of figuring out proxies for that, uh, which are coming out, which I think are, are interesting areas of study. So. Thank you, Joel. That's actually a very um, um, uh, innovative way to look at uh, data and how they are capturing informality uh, satellite data. Thank you. Can I ask a question To I have one question for Joel as well, and then um, also another one about Africa's agency. I think I just wanted to, you know, like, because also we have in our governance definition this very strong element of public service delivery, no? Um, so also when we analyze, as I said before, the, the sort of uh, how growth has translated into opportunities for people, we also take into account all these elements of human development, like social safety mm -hmm. nets and all this kind of thing. Obviously this is not uh, over present in Africa, but it's, it's a discussion that is ongoing. And there is also a discussion about, for instance, providing universal health coverage and all issues that have become very um, sort of important when it comes, for instance, to the COVID-19 crisis and how this has highlighted, for instance, the total absence of social protection in certain countries. Is it something that comes up in your analysis of incentives to, for instance, get out of informality or it's, it's not related to that debate or what, what is your position on that? What do you think? Um, I, I think for my specific uh, context of the, uh, the townships in Cape Town, um, we've seen that there's actually a, a lack of faith in, in, in the state in delivering their, their services and delivering social services. And so um, I think that's actually a disincentive for them to, to, to register um, and a disincentive for them to pay taxes because they don't know what their taxes are going towards. You know, it's, um, and so I think in in place of that, what we've seen is that there have these informal safety nets that have occurred uh, that have developed within the townships themselves, which are mostly along communal, ethnic, religious lines. Um, and so that is off that offers more of a substitute for the services that uh, the municipality of Cape Town and the South African government should be providing in those in those contexts. So, um, so yeah, I think that's that's kind of uh, what what I've seen happening in that, and then I think it varies from one context to the next, obviously, but uh, just for that particular context, yeah. Um, yes, I, 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 go ahead. Yeah. Sorry, if someone else has a question, they can they can go ahead, but uh, um, I can wait till later. Please go on. I, I can ask it later. Okay. Um, I just, um, uh, Camilla, I just had a, a question for you actually about the, uh, uh, about the, and this is something which I think was brought up in, in the chat too, but um, I think uh, the, the idea that the 
participation rights and inclusion has deteriorated uh, in, in many countries, but you still see positive changes in economic and, and, and human development. Uh, you, you talked a little bit about the, the fact that you, know, you could have perhaps unequal growth, which is happening perhaps in upper echelons while, while leaving, uh, leaving other, I guess, segments of the population behind. Um, but like, what do you see as driving that, that, this, that distinction between uh, um, you know, economic growth versus uh, the lack of participation um, or the lack of public involvement, I guess? Is, yeah. I think, I mean, we can, I mean, it's, it's, um, I can give you like the, the sort of higher level results, but then obviously I can also provide you with a little bit more detailed um, response because it's, it's quite a complex analysis when you sort of unpack all the different results at various, at various level. But first of all, when we say um, progress in foundation for economic opportunity, we have to see what drives this progress. And for instance, if you look at that, you see that for instance, infrastructure is one of the main drivers for the score change, the improvement in foundation for economic opportunity, okay? So uh, this is basically what has been, um, I think it's one of the most improved indicator across all countries, this. And, and that results in basically a higher level of performance and then obviously depending on country context you can have countries that also have other elements of foundation for economic opportunity driving progress or other elements sort of holding back progress but this is valid for the whole continent and then when it comes to the decline in terms of participation rights and inclusion i would say that the main driver of change here is uh, um, sort of a closing civic space, civic and democratic space. So you see what I mean? Like these are generated, these two outcomes are generated by two completely different, mm. uh, if, you, if you call it like that policy processes, you see what I mean? Right. In the sense that infrastructure is, you know, like it's the level, like the, the sort of presence of um, uh, like railroads and other infrastructure on the country and on the continent. And then the other one is more, it's more measuring, you know, to what extent there is a conducive space for civil society and other democratic processes on the continent. So it's so driven by completely different landscapes. But mm. I think uh, what is important to note is that, uh, as I said before, our index is not prioritizing any governance dimension. It is an unweighted index. So every um, sort of variable has the same weight as all the others. And what counts uh, for us in, as like the key message in this sense is that, you know, like we should not forget any governance dimension. Obviously, when it comes also to the fact that participation rights and inclusions, which you know, in, in our Western understanding is also one of the core ingredients of good governance, and you know, like uh, in general, one of the foundations of democracy as well. This seems to be sort of more important than other elements. But we would make the same statement even if there was progress, for instance, in, 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 in democracy and lack of progress in economy, because the way the index is built is really like giving the same space and the same weight to all the dimensions. Um, obviously, when you see uh, the decline in participation rights and inclusion, and you see also how long this decline has been ongoing, um, this is a sign of alert because as, as we sort of captured also from your presentation, there seems to be a huge um, sort of gap being created between governments and citizens and also this lack of trust. It's an emerging issue. We analyze this in separate publications, for instance, but we see that there is a, a, a sort of, uh, you know, like uh, a complete uh, distance being created between citizens and their political leadership. And this is something that then, you know, like can uh, continue fueling this, this deteriorating environment for participation rights and inclusion. And I do believe that the 2022 index, so we do provide a data set every two years. So the 2022 index will also um, give us quite interesting results because it will take into account the additional impact of COVID-19 on all these dynamics as well. So, yeah, I mean, I, 
I don't know if you have any other specific question, but then I can also send everyone the tools that we have to sort of unpack by yourself all the underlying indicators and the underlying sub indicators for each of these components so that you can really go down to the nitty gritty and see what has been driving progress in which countries and in what dimensions. Thank you. That would be helpful, Camilla. Thank you. And um, actually, there was a question as well on uh, the chat box, which I think I've missed earlier. Uh, so yes, this is a question about um, um, colonial legacy. And uh, OK, there's expectation that the US and Europe to have invested more to pay back their historical debt. And they had sh should have known uh, Africa much better than China until recently. Why is it uh, that it takes China to put some competitive pressure on the US and Europe to do more now? Um, um, uh, it's about geopolitics, if I can put it, but Fula Shadi, would you like to address this question? Um, maybe just the final part, the, the question in itself on, yes. um, on why it takes uh, China to put some competitive pressure on the US and Europe to do more now. Um, I wouldn't really put it this way. I think it's important to know that, um, well, first, you know, what China has been doing in Africa was part of its, uh, you know, internal strategy of uh, going out in trying to find more, more markets. You know, it's about market diversification and finding markets for um, over capacity in some materials like aluminium and steel uh, in, within China. Also uh, within China, you know, there were not uh, sufficient I infrastructure or let's say the, 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 there were um, too many uh, contractors for very few projects. So going out was part also uh, of uh, th this strategy. Um, so it's first, it's a Chinese strategy to go uh, in Africa. And yes, this creates competition with uh, the US and in Europe and maybe what I would say is that uh, it's important to mention that all these uh, let's say more than half of all these infrastructure projects that are funded by China were um, first uh, you know presented to traditional partners to the Europe and the US uh, and they didn't receive funding from them and it's also a question of strategy uh, in the aid strategy or the development strategy more largely, infrastructure was not considered a priority uh, if by uh, Europeans and the US in Africa. It was the case, let's say in the early 80s, 90s, also the World Bank was very invested, but then uh, questions related to um, uh, I would say governance, human rights, you know, to and also with the rise of the, with, let's say, with the implementation of the Millennium Development Goals and now the SDGs, these questions became uh, a priority as well. And so uh, infrastructure was a bit put uh, aside. Not that it's not important or, you know, that governance is more important than infrastructure. Uh, uh, what I'm saying is that in terms of infrastructure priorities, th there were not many. Um, you know, there were not many providers. And so China filled a bit this gap. And so that, that's why this competition is created because also not only in the infrastructure sector, but China is going beyond that and you know, investing more and more uh, relations. And I'm think, talking about China, but also, you know, the, Turkey is very much uh, competing with China. There's not much discussion about that as well. You know, the, the competition between the BRICS countries in Africa, it tends to be all presented through a US uh, versus China, US versus Europe, but Turkey and, uh, and China are competing a lot in these markets. Russia is competing a lot with China in mining projects in Guinea, for instance. Uh, so it's, uh, I just wanted to mention that. So, but yeah, overall, that's the, the answer that I would have. It's more, um, it's, it's about now they are, there's a reconsideration of priorities. And uh, I think that China has to do a lot uh, with that. Yeah. Thank you. Um, uh, Imam Din, you had a question, I think, as well, right? Yeah, it's a question actually directed to Camilla and Joel at the same time from different perspectives. Um, I mean, public value is kind of a core concept um, uh, 
in our center that we want to discuss whatever public value of course means nevertheless um looking at at the governance index the Mo ibrahim index i think you 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 cover a lot of things um that that we would understand that that, that are important in order to create public uh, value nevertheless taking a bit uh, the the input uh, by Joel, um and the key message was, yeah, we have to study what what, what is there, what, what we have instead of what is lacking. And on that, that's a, that sense, how can you ensure that you that you really capture uh, what is there um, and and not only what is lacking? So I'm, I'm thinking, for example, about the Kotla system in Botswana. Um, that is a, a, a tr traditional system for engaging. People can engage the how. Uh, able are you really to 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 measure um, such activities that are less formalized let's say exactly from a western point of view and at the same time Joel maybe you who have worked more um, from an inductive approach focused on economic activities but, but do you see maybe exactly some um, rather activities in in political sense um, that are neglect neglected in in traditional um, governance measuring indexes um, that needed to be highlighted. Yeah, it's it's a very interesting question. It's also like mm, this whole idea of um, challenges of averages as well, because you know, like the the, the limit of the index is that we do want to create a, a data set that is comparable okay because of a number of reasons because first of all we want to provide the different layers of analysis over a governance category level for the continent for the regions for the countries for group of countries across time and all that and so we the the, the comparability element is is a fundamental aspect of it okay um so the, the, the struggle that we have is that on the other hand, we have in front of us a continent that is made of 54 countries, so it's not even, <laughs> to say the least. And uh, on the other hand, we also have an emerging debate, which is what you just pointed out, which is the need for local data, for uh, understanding local dynamics, and also for you know, like um, always contextualizing this big level uh, of conceptual uh, definitions and understanding in the local reality. Problem is that our index cannot do everything. And so we decided to go for this element of comparability at the expense of living on the side, the, the sort of local, uh, the local data. Um, we are aware of this and we are also extremely interested in all the research, for instance, that go beyond the national level. Uh, for instance, there is quite a lot of um, interesting data provided across Africa at regional and um, you know, county level within countries about access to water, access to electricity. And then you realize that, you know, like providing national level data sometimes is very limiting because you think you know, like you have captured the average life of a citizen, but then you go on the ground and you see that, you know, like the picture is completely different. But as I said, we cannot do everything. And we do propose this index as an entry point. And we also do provide quite a lot of advocacy and commitment from the foundation point of view in um, towards creating uh, more and more data capacity on the African continent to fill exactly this gap and to, you know, like, and to make sure that in, in few years to come, we will have a proliferation of data that also sort of covers this gap and complements our index down to the level of uh, local communities and, and all that. Because, you know, ultimately, as you say, it's part of the governance relationship. Citizens are the uh, end recipient of this governance relationship. And it's very important to sort of go there to that level to understand how things are. The citizens' voices section that we have added to the index is partly addressing this because we are using data from Afrobarometer, which are then aggregated at country level. But the way Afrobarometer works is also 
through sampling very diverse um, samples in terms of uh, sort of social representation, age representation, but also geographical representation. So when we look at the citizen perception section of the index, there this diversity is somehow captured, but still the data is always provided at national level. And so I, I think the approach that we've uh, taken and that SLF has taken is, you know, the uh, is a different side of the trade-off from what Camilla talked about. So I think Camilla, she mentioned that her, her work in, uh, in the Mo Ibrahim Foundation is about comparability amongst different countries at the expense of, uh, at the expense of specific context related uh, data, right? And that's, I guess that, that, that's always a trade-off involved with this. And I think um, that's also the weak side for, for the data that we've collected too, which is that there's specific uh, variables which are associated with yeah. the micro area census, which do not lend themselves to comparability across different contexts. And, and I'll give you an example. So one of the things that we've, one of the variables that SLF has collected in, in their data is, um, uh, is the presence of jealousy. Right, so it's it's a very specific context-related um, uh, construct variable, which is based on ethnic tensions in the townships from various people coming from different parts of Africa and from, but even as far as Bangladesh and China, and uh, like a very like a highly diverse religious environment too. So so jealousy is something which is particular to that context. And I'm not sure if that variable would translate necessarily well to 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 other contexts if you were to if you were to do that kind of comparability, um, and and even beyond that, there's also the issue of, you know, when we do these micro area census, census censuses, I guess, is the question of whether sensei, the question of whether uh, the data that we get from these participants is actually uh, is actually truthful or not, right? So. Um, one of the ways in which we've overcome that is to hire uh, participants, to hire survey takers from the townships themselves to conduct this. So there's a there's higher level of trust involved with uh, with collecting this data rather than you know participants telling you what you want to hear. Um, so so yeah, I think it's just to highlight that you know um, that there's two different approaches here. Um, where Camilla's talked about comparability, we've talked about. We focus more on context, uh, and each has their their trade offs associated with it, right? So, but I think they're complementary. It's, um, yeah. Thank you. And I I don't have a questions, but I just wanted perhaps to to just just a link of, of a, the the different items we have been discussing today. And I'd just like to take an example that both Camilla and Fula Shade mentioned. Uh, at some point, you, uh, you use the example of Somalia. Uh, Camilla, you mentioned how Somalia is at the bottom of the um, uh, governance index at the moment, but yet uh, it's, it's the trend is also on the rise. So uh, in comparison with other countries. And then also, uh, for Ashada, you mentioned the, I, the, the, um, the, the point that some countries are taking a keen interest in some countries and that interest uh, uh, vary, that interest varies. So um, for example, we can have Turkey's interest in Somalia. And if that is happening, why? If we ask ourselves why, one conception could be because yes, there is that uh, competition between China and Turkey, for example, and they could have an interest in, in Somalia. And the other uh, um, hypothesis could be that, yes, because Somalia is at the end of the governance index, it means that in terms of data on uh, participation and rights and inclusion, it's behind. That could be that, that, that normally misconception that it's behind on human rights and so on. That's why you have uh, external partners showing an interest because it can be easier to, to do some, um, to, to, to get into work uh, relationships. But uh, Fulashadi, as you've mentioned, if we flip the question, why would ha Somalia have interest back in those new partners, emerging partners and so on? It would depend, as you've mentioned, on the actors and the resources and context. So um, my point is, when we are trying to analyze a question like why uh, would there be interest in, um, in Somalia, 
a country who's uh, on the governance index is behind in participation, inclusion and rights, for example, uh, we need to also uh, think of a question of why would Somalia show interest back? The idea of, you know, escaping from political isolation, you've mentioned that, but as also as you've mentioned, Joel, the idea of context and resources and actors, thinking about the specific sets of actors. Uh, I know I'm not, uh, I don't have all the accurate data, but I was just trying to link the, the points we have addressed today and uh, linking data and context and uh, agency. So that was my aim. <laughs> I hope I'm making sense and perhaps some food for thought as well for me to reflect on later on. Yep. I think one, one thing that we can add is also the, the issue that across all our presentation, we really realize that there is a huge gap between the reality and uh, misperceptions, for instance. We saw, for instance, this whole idea of like how growth in, you know, like the, the, what we consider by misperception, the absence of growth is in reality hiding a, a full level of entrepreneurship, creativity and all that. We already see like in the China-Africa relationship, this whole idea of, uh, you know, China being perceived as, uh, uh, by definition, bad versus other traditional partners, whereas there is actually some very practical uh, implications of the relationship that are showing that the relationship work, it works, is evolving, and there has been also some pragmatic um, sort of advantages of this. So I, I think the, the, the question that we always need to ask when we work about, um, we work on um, like African governance, political issues is really like uh, to what extent we can contribute to uh, continue um, bringing back the, the, the narrative, you know, like continue sort of readdressing the narrative uh, about, uh, about, uh, about Africa and also to what extent we can use our research and the data to showcase reality versus misperceptions and other similar um, misrepresentations of the reality, which I think is super important. And I, I would add very briefly, Adila, that it's important also to consider, um, you know, when you look at it from African perspectives, to look also at the internal domestic uh, politics dimension. In the case of Somalia or any other country like uh, the CAR or uh, Guinea, there's also this question of regime survival, meaning internally, you know, how in, in terms of regime uh, legitimacy and uh, bringing in and um, forging partnerships with external partners also allows them to show that we are active you know, we, we will deliver. Um, so it's important uh, and also in no way maybe to uh, address criticism by the opposition. Uh, so, and this question is not necessarily only related to Somalia, any, all these other countries taking the example of Senegal, for instance, you know, or even Benin Republic where I'm from, it's important to look at all these not only the, the intermestics, as we call it in, in political science, the, you know, this, this, this connection, this intersection between international and domestic politics. Thank yeah. you. Imamdin. Sorry, go sure. ahead, Joel. Sure, no, no, I, I, just, I just wanted to, I, I, I think, um, you know, uh, one commonality I saw also between myself and uh, Furashade is that there's this idea of agency as well too, which is, which is common in, at different levels for her, it's about agency at the country level. Um, and for, in, in our context, it's really these individuals exercising agency um, in, in contexts which are resource de deprived, uh, but they are nonetheless extremely creative um, and, you know, uh, serving their, um, you know, was making a better uh, situation, a better future for themselves. And I think that's something which we, which we see as common at, at different, um, different levels, uh, individual, organizational, or uh, or national level. So, yeah. Yeah, you, you're taking a bit, you're playing the ball. Um, it's a bit what I also wanted to say. First of all, thank you very much to all three speakers. Although they were very, very diverse, I think it was still really interesting to see these different viewpoints. At the same time, I think we realized that there are also some gaps, exactly because we had different uh, views. Um, question that arose for myself was really okay. We we kind of really need to define and conceptualize what 
the core concept for our center is public value, but what is public value in the African context, or better said, in the African contexts in plural, um, as, as it is really diverse. I think that that's an important thing uh, to carve out. And from this space is also then to think about, okay, how can we measure it um, in order to allow comparison, but at the same time, without lacking uh, relevant aspects um, that might be ignored if we, if we have a true, uh, uh, macro perspective and on this space we're thinking about okay what actions can we do um what are our policy implications in order to create and, and contribute to the public value in this different context that's on a macro level and so exactly uh for the shot has talked about about agency um kind of not only being dependent on the old relationships the old uh, partners and broadening up the partners what implications does it have? But at the same time, at, at the micro level, as you have just said, uh, Joel, in order to, to improve public value for citizens um, in Africa. So I uh, thank you very much. I found it really insightful. And um, yeah, thank you for your time and, and contribution. Thank you. This time we've been five minutes uh, beyond our time. We appreciate your patience and thank you to all our participants for the questions and a big thank you to all our uh, speakers. Much appreciated. Uh, it is very helpful insights to us at the center. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you, you everyone. Invitation. Thank you. And uh, we continue connecting yeah. and we continue the discussion. Bye. Thank you. Exactly. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Just one uh, bye -bye. reminder quickly um, for the next oh. webinar, the third webinar will be probably on the 20th of October when we more want to look at this smartness aspect of smart government. So we definitely let you know about um, uh, what exactly going to be. So but just as a first reminder and thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you again. Bye. Yep. Bye.